So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending where you are. And welcome to the Baltimore Rotterdam Designing Cities uh, ser conversation series. I am Christina Murphy. I am an associate professor, as assistant professor at Morgan State uh, University, the School of Architecture and Planning. And in this hour, we will see examples of how we design cities for and with people in an attempt to generate spaces more equal and livable. The center of this critique is the city and the communities. For four Tuesdays till March the 7th, 18 architects from Baltimore, the US and Rotterdam, the Netherlands, moderated by four international moderators, will together with you answer the question, how do architects design spaces for people? This question has been left general and open on purpose. Each of the four round tables will explore designers that designs that value infrastructure, cities, public spaces, communities, and individuals. Before I move on with this, I would like to inform you, that, uh, inform the audience that this is a recorded session. Please put yourself on mute and keep your camera off unless you want, unless you're a panelist. For those interested in getting the AIA credits, we do collect your name and your AIA number. The link is on the chat, so please uh, click on it and, um, and follow the procedure. We also do take questions. Please either chat, either write it on the chat box or raise your hand and our moderator will be taking your question and inquiry. Today's moderator is Selena Abrams. Selena is a PhD candidate at the University of Amsterdam. She's currently studying collaborative planning processes with citizens within sustainability-driven urban planning projects in the Netherlands. Her research investigates the connection between research and creativity and creative methods. The research project falls within the NWO project. Transition and Behavior, Trans B. Selina was born in India and moved to the Netherlands in 2016, studying urbanism at the TU Delft. She has a background in architecture, urban planning, and entrepreneurship. Selina, thank you very much for accepting this invitation. Please take the lead. Um, thank you, Christina, for having me. Uh, I'm super excited to be uh, moderating this discussion on how we can claim back spaces historically divided by infrastructure and how we can use infrastructure design to consciously contribute to people's health, well-being, prosperity, environmental resilience. And today we find out from uh, four architects how we can, in big and small ways, look at um, infrastructure being generous uh, as opposed to being disruptive. Um, so today, continuing this collaboration between Baltimore and Rotterdam, we have uh, Martin van Bremen from uh, Group A. Um, we have uh, Scott Wheat, Principal uh, at Design Collective, uh, Case van Pasteren, uh, Associate at OMA, and Jerome C. Gray, Founder and Architect at Jerome C. Gray Architect. Um, so uh, today we're going to be starting with Martin van Bremen. Um, uh, to quickly introduce him. Um, one second. Uh, Martin uh, graduated at TU Delft uh, and founded Group A in 1996 together with Volker van Hagen and Adam Fisser. He is an expert in the field of reuse and reno uh, renovation, focusing on early modern architecture and monuments. His award-winning award work comprises of the um, renovation of the brutalist subway stations of the Metro Oost Line. Amsterdam, the renovation of the Nordic Monumental Office Dammen Shipyard in Flissingen, and the transformation of a former 14,500 square meter warehouse in Rotterdam's Harbor District into an activity based building offering space to sustainably create, produce, and meet. Um, these projects have been awarded the NRP Golden Phoenix Frame Award and Dutch Daylight Award. Uh, Group A's work has been exhibited at Design Museum in London, Cultural Capital Porto, and Arkham in Amsterdam, amongst others. So with great, with great pleasure, I'm happy to give the floor to Martin, who's going to talk about his work. Um, yeah. Um, thank you, Selina. Thank you for this kind uh, introduction. I will uh, share my screen 
uh, the presentation. I oh, who can share all present. Uh, I, I I want to share my screen. Uh, yes, um, this is the presentation. So I hope you can all see it. Um, yeah, uh, all good here. Yes, you can see it. Yep. Okay. Um, I wanted to uh, start with the uh, uh, a picture in, of Rotterdam, um, where you see uh, the OMA building, uh, de Rotterdam, where Case uh, Case uh, has been working on. Uh, but you also see in the middle uh, a building which has not been built, and it's called uh, Baltimore. So we have a Baltimore in Rotterdam, and I thought there was a good link to this, uh, to, uh, this uh, introduction of Rotterdam Baltimore. And on the other side, we designed a building uh, on the other side of the water, which is also not been built. Um, Uh, the office, this is the Netherlands for the people who don't know, and Rotterdam is um, at a, a cross point of these uh, uh, threats, and it's a harbor city, and uh, that's where we come in. Uh, uh, we, uh, we exist for 25 years in Rotterdam, and our building is in the harbor area, so this is our building. Um, and uh, this is the office uh, with the people. Um, uh, we have uh, had, uh, through the 25 years, we had a lot of people and a lot of projects. Um, and these projects, can we can divide it into kind of office projects, uh, uh, housing, mixed use, uh, interior, reuse, transformation, uh, mobility and infra infrastructure, which I will show uh, later uh, in this presentation. We do also uh, urban design, uh, some industrial projects, but uh, um, mainly we do it all uh, people focused. So these are the uh, project um, areas, um, and uh, we do it uh, project uh, people focused. So we, we call it social co cohesion in the, um, uh, let me see, uh, social co cohesion uh, projects. And uh, in all these projects, there are of course social spaces, uh, but we, um, uh, we think we do a step extra um, by uh, having uh, social spaces in a certain way. I'll show you a couple of examples. Uh, this is the Caballero factory in The Hague, one of my first big uh, restoration renovation projects. And we, uh, we came up with a concept um, and, and it's, yeah, uh, we call it in Dutch, we call it kruisbestuiving. So in English, it's cross-pollination. And uh, this was uh, really quite early uh, before all these factories uh, we're in reuse and we developed a concept together with two uh, people who rented uh, rent in the space and uh, together with the municipality. And there are now uh, 500 people working in this, uh, in this building with a hundred companies and it's 15,000 square meters big. Um, some, some pictures here. And um, the social space we made is uh, not only uh, like uh, uh, two places of restaurants where you can eat and, and just have some uh, very cheap uh, lunch, but also a six meter uh, wide hallway where there's a, a walking area in, but also a, a communal area, a sitting area with uh, pantries, um, uh, chat boxes or uh, where you can have meeting meetings, um, et cetera. Another very social project we did is the renovation uh, of the Metro Oostline in Amsterdam. It's 16 stations. We had a very simple uh, concept of cleaning and making the space uh, readable again for the public. These are five underground stations and 11 above ground stations. And on the left, there's a picture how it was. And on the right, uh, this is uh, what we uh, did. It's quite a brutalistic style. Uh, it's rough concrete 
but we opened it up. We made wooden uh, uh, hand uh, handrail and uh, uh, a very light environment. Uh, the result is a very touchable uh, and 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 clean and and uh, a metro where the the overview is um, is uh, and the transparency is uh, is key. Uh, then the offices in Rotterdam, uh, it's, it's in the building, the Rotterdam, uh, we did the interior, uh, not the out, uh, not the outside case, uh, did, um, but, uh, and our ma did, uh, but we did the interior and, uh, there's a very, uh, social, like, uh, key space in the middle of the building and it's, uh, it's like the city center of a, of a whole uh, uh, uh elevator uh orientated floor uh, division and uh in this in this middle area uh, as a as a as a public space a restaurant a service a space you can find everything uh, this is the building that is the um it's the middle middle building of the of the of the six or of the three and uh, one small story, uh, all the office chairs, uh, the, the municipality moved to this building from like uh, 30 locations and all the office chairs, we, uh, we renovated and upholstered um, with the, uh, uh, with uh, the Sociale Werkplaats, uh, the social uh, work spot of uh, Rotterdam, they did, they did the transport and the social work spot of The Hague they uh, did the upholstering so out of the three uh, um, thousand chairs or even more we picked only the good ones and uh, we upholstered them and we saved one million of the interior budget on chairs by doing this uh, but also in a very social way and 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 it was um, done very well in combination then about our own uh, building, uh, Keilepand in Rotterdam. Uh, it's in a very uh, rural area. It's in a harbor area. Uh, it's in, in, in a harbor area, M M4H, it's called, together with the RDM. It's, it's a very big area. It's even uh, as big as the whole inner city of Rotterdam itself. And you see that it is uh, enclosed uh, on, on the west side uh, with uh, Schiedam. Uh, on the north side, uh, um, it's a, st a station, but also housing. And on the on the west side, it's uh, Bospolder Tussendijke, and um, um, uh, and 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 the city of Rotterdam. So it's a very big area, and uh, you know it's going to change this harbor area. And that's where I want to talk about a bit longer, but I make don't make it too long. Uh, the Keilepand, our, our building, is, is, is uh, right on the you know, west side of the M4H area. It's um, in between a container area and, and, and uh, stock uh, areas. And um, it's, it's still in the, in the, in the length of our, our old harbor. Um, and you see, and, and here's an old uh, rail track uh, uh, which is now big shops it's called but it's it was a used to be a, a rail track area and it's it's very rough and very not yet um, uh, um, neat it's not yet neat um, so these are some old pictures older pictures of the building which uh, was built in uh, 100 years ago and it was as an example on the on the fair, the, the the building fair in Barcelona. There was a model, and there was this drawing, um, and it was also the um, example for the Fanelle Fabrique, which is also a famous building in in the Netherlands, because um, uh, this building was one of the four first concrete buildings, and it was uh, built with these mushroom columns to save material. To, to to have not too much concrete uh, in it, but it was for uh, storage. It was a a, a a building, a harbor building, which then collected building uh, goods from the sea ships and and uh, transported it uh, to the uh, inner ships and uh, the, the the river ships. Um, it was uh, a building after the bomb 
bombardment in Rotterdam, which which was sturdy, which was still there. Only the roof lights were were uh, broken. So it was also um, a building, uh, one of the buildings where the martial help help started uh, when uh, when after the war the uh, goods came from uh, America to uh, Rotterdam to uh, build it up again. Um, but it's a very social building and we have all kind of uh, users uh, uh, in here. It's also as big as the Caballero factory. It's 15,000 square meters and uh, it's in three layers. And uh, we do uh, their interior uh, builders. Uh, it's really a making industry uh, on the ground floor. Uh, but there is also like architects' offices on the on the on the first floor, and in the basement there's uh, storage of uh, wood and uh, food, and there's uh, uh, food kitchens, and um, we have an exhibition hall in there, and uh, we have a lecture hall. So it's a very lively building you know, with a lot of things uh, uh, happening. Uh, um, I'm now personally also busy to get a kind of a jazz club in the basement. It's, it's a lot of fun to get it uh, also there. So it's we want, really want a 24-hour uh, beehive um, there. We lunch together and now we have a, a big rest, bigger restaurant downstairs. This was in the uh, beginning where we built the kitchen and we made the lamps ourselves. And you see in front of us, uh, in length of the old harbor, this was a harbor area, uh, there's the food garden. Uh, it's really a working ecosystem uh, with the food garden where we uh, the food is made for also the restaurant in, uh, or the, grow, the, the vegetables are grown for the, uh, the food union, which is in our building, but also on the other side, there's the uh, futsal bank uh, the, for uh, a social uh, for for people who don't uh, can get cannot get uh, uh, have money to get food from the gro uh, groceries from the supermarket. There's uh, uh, fresh vegetables and 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 herbs and uh, um, fruits uh, grown here. Um, and we also help them with uh, sponsoring and uh, we help them with the whole system of sponsoring. So there's a lot happening in the neighborhood. There are artists, etc. We made our building, we made it also because we believe that's very, very important. We made it um, um, uh, from energy level J, uh, J, uh, J to uh, A+. Plus. Uh, I don't know if that that some, says something, but we want to uh, really uh, have have um, a, a energy efficient building. We what we did, we made heat pumps here. We had floor heating. We have a, a heat and cold exchange, uh, uh, and we have a big uh, reflection uh, roof with uh, thick isolation, also isolation inside. So it, for a hundred year old building, it's really really interesting how. Um, it's not easy to get this, but it's doable to, to get an A plus label. And in 25, we want to have uh, no uh, no gas anymore, but and, and PV cells and get uh, all the water we uh, we want to reuse it inside the building. Uh, one more uh, minute, Martin. Not to rush yes. you, but this I'll is the last slide. <laughs> it's almost the last slide. So we have a lot of lectures and exhibitions in the building. Uh, we want to, we want, we do a debate with the uh, with the uh, uh, users and the, and the houses uh, and the people in the neighborhood. And it's not a highbrow debate. It's really a debate where we, we talk about food, we talk about energy, we would talk about all these um, you know, topics where where everyone can relate to. And you see a lot of neighbors uh, coming to these debates. So we want a social cohesion. Uh, it's not only working, it's also a, a, a lot of debate playing and seeing. So this is our working space. And this is the last slide. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Martin. Um, do I have any questions from uh, anybody for Martin for the moment? Uh, the floor is always open for questions after uh, our speakers. Um,
but if there are any urgent pressing questions now, I'm happy to uh, share them to Martin just now. Um, if not, uh, Martin, uh, I actually had a, a happened to be at Caballero Fabric a few months ago, and I didn't know it was uh, by Group A. It was a super nice space. What I really liked about it was the variety of spaces. Mm -hmm. And I was always surprised at every corner because it, it almost kind of uh, it changes at every moment. It was it was a really lovely uh, experience. Um, have you ever been to any of your projects uh, years later and been and and has how people used it surprised you in any way? Uh, yes, I, I, I still come to the Caballero factory quite often. Uh, one place I don't come so often is the a crematorium we made so that's very good to not be there too often um but um um no it's good to see your own work uh, years later uh, and i really i'm i'm i i really uh i'm i'm really into projects in the beginning phase but also in the end phase the detail phase i think it's really important i think also you can get a better be a better designer uh, uh, when you know more about the details of the materials, how they uh, behave and how they uh, uh, age. So uh, I think that is very, very important. I think the middle phase is, uh, is uh, where I have to go, let go. And then uh, at the end phase, I'm back again. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, we'll get back to you after all the presentations where we have a more uh, discussion. Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd like to, uh, yeah. I just put I'd some like light on because I think I'm a bit dark in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, I'd like to now introduce our next speaker, Scott Reed. Uh, Scott is a design principal at Design Collective with 30 years of experience in higher education, student housing, adaptive reuse, and workplace. His passion for making positive contributions to place and community and ability to process and lead complex projects have allowed him to work within numerous communities across the nation. His inclusive process allows projects to be well-informed and inclusive of diverse ideas and perspectives. His project has been honored with over 50 design awards. So with uh, that, I'm happy to uh, open the floor to Scott. Looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Selena. Appreciate the introduction. Um, just a little bit more about our firm before I jump into a couple of topics. Um, we have 80 employees and we're employee owned. We're very proud of that. Um, we work all over the country. Uh, we are at home here, right in Baltimore, in the Inner Harbor, overlooking Inner Harbor. We just moved into a new office space about three months ago with spectacular views. I wish you could see them, but um, we also are a multidisciplinary firm. We work in architecture, interiors, landscape, planning, and signage and graphics. So we have uh, a great number of uh, skills that we can bring to any project, which we are proud of. And then we work in many different uh, uh, place types of projects, multifamily, workplace, landscape, urban design, uh, higher education, K through 12. Um, so we, we pride ourselves in not being experts just in one type of architecture. Um, the, the kind of generous city and infrastructure thing I'd love to talk to you guys about today is something that I've been passionate about for a long time in Salem, and we're at a key moment in this, which is uh, Baltimore's Inner Harbor. And um, for those of you not familiar with Baltimore, we are almost at the head of the Chesapeake Bay here, so we're pretty far up the bay. We have a, a very unique sighting in that we are connected to multiple types of transportation infrastructure. We have Route 95 that runs right through our city. It connects Maine all the way down to Florida. It's a 2000 mile long highway. We have multiple connections to rail and of course, multiple connections to shipping via water because of our unique position on the bay itself. Um, when I zoom in a little bit on the city itself, here's the inner harbor, what we call the inner harbor here. Here's the middle branch down here. Our city really surrounds this portion of the bay, which is also unique. There are a lot of cities that front on water, whether it's a lake, a river, a bay that are typically on one side, we have this unique position we, where we surround it. And it's really kind of, I, I believe our crown jewel. And if we zoom in a little bit more on some of the infrastructure, you can sort of see this blue dot here. There's a rail lines that come through the city. There obviously are shipping channels that lead into the inner harbor. 
There are multiple bus routes, of course, that connect to downtown and highways. This is actually I-95 right here, if you can see my mouse, and it actually disappears into a tunnel, goes under the harbor here, and reemerges on this side as it heads north all the way up to Maine. So all these, uh, you know, the infrastructure of transportation I talk about come right through the heart of our city. And in fact, there's also another Highway 83 that comes down through the city right here. And there was a plan at one time to have a bridge that was going to come across the heart of the bay, go through a park all the way through here that would have been very destructive and luckily was uh, stopped uh, into its, during its planning. So we're lucky that did not happen. And then zooming in a little bit farther, our office right now is right here. So we have this great view all the way out the bay. We've been fortunate enough to work on some projects like the Science Center here in the Inner Harbor, the Visitor Center. We've done a lot of work with the aquarium, the National Aquarium that sits here and the uh, renovation of a, a former power plant that sits here that used to be where our offices were up until a couple of months ago. Um, the enormous opportunity here in Baltimore is that um, the Inner Harbor itself is kind of flagging. Uh, this was long time, a uh, very popular destination for tourists, for visitors, and for residents of Baltimore. There's a unique promenade system that goes all the way around the harbor that is open to anybody, to the public. Of course, the water is as, as well. But then in addition to some of these uh, places that I just mentioned, there are two buildings here that were festival marketplaces in their heyday that had food uh, restaurants in it, food stalls that were open to everybody, accessible to everybody. Um, but over the years kind of transformed more to chain restaurants, which led to a lack of residents using them or business people downtown using them. And then of course, the, the, the kind of failure of brick, uh, brick and mortar retail, followed by some crime issues that we've had, followed by a pandemic. And now um, this area is nowhere near as active as it used to be. So there's enormous opportunity here that's upcoming with a new developer that has control of these two buildings to kind of re-envision the harbor, what it could be, and current uh, are consistent with our theme here, how can it be generous to the entire city, not just certain residents of the city. So here's a good picture of, uh, you know, the Inner Harbor in its heyday, giant crowds coming, both residents, conventioneers, visitors for the weekend, it was very popular. It doesn't frankly feel like this today. It's uh, There are people that still use it, but a lot of things are closed. And uh, so we're really at a key moment, as I mentioned, because we have all these great pieces around it and it's very scenic. You know, with the, here's the aquarium here. We have a large outdoor concert venue here. And just the, you know, the spectacular views of the harbor itself, you can see where the, the potential would be for a, a, a beautiful city like this to take advantage of this kind of crown jewel. Um, so what I wanted to talk about is um, the project that we did for the city of College Park, which is about 50 miles down the road. And the reason I wanted to talk about this is because it was another project that was uh, uh, enormously important for this area because there was an opportunity to be generous for the city of College Park and give back something to all the residents, all of the students at the University of Maryland. Um, and I think the process that we use could be a, a process that I would hope would be embraced for the planning of the Inner Harbor itself, which is a very inclusive process. So what you see here in this red is the University of Maryland. This is its campus here. The city largely exists over here. There's a little bit of an overlap here, and that is kind of the heart of the town and gown area here. This is Route 1 that was used to be the major connector between Baltimore and Washington. And our site is right on Route 1, and you can see it's kind of at the nexus of these two areas. Um, the original, sorry, the original plan that came out of a master plan was to have two separate buildings on that site, one for the university and one for City Hall. The idea was that this, the city and the university got together and wanted to do a project that was symbolic of their partnership uh, and their, their efforts to make the city of College Park a better place. So they decided to share the site, uh, have some shared amenities between them, elevators, stairs, and such, uh, a small entry plaza out on Baltimore Avenue with some outdoor dining. And then they wanted to, to maximize the site by perhaps having a future office building at the back of the site. This site, by the way, exists 
where the the exist the original city hall was. So the idea was to demolish the original city hall, use this site. Um, we came back with an inclusive uh, process that involved all the citizens, all the students. We had three town halls in different areas of the city, one specifically for students to gather input, one for the city council, one for the government, and one for the users. Uh, and with the hopes of coming out of the, the, that whole interactive process with guiding principles. So, so we established guiding principles based on what we heard from all those groups and interactions and discussions with them. And they, the, the guiding principle, some of the guiding principles that came out of it was to have an open and inviting space, to have a highly functional and easily navigated building, plenty of natural light. And this is, I think, one of the most important ones was to create a heart for the city, which is similar to what the Inner Harbor is for Baltimore. Uh, they wanted an outdoor space that was active, flexible, and they wanted it to be available to all residents and students and ex highly accessible and encourage interaction between all different types of groups. So those were very key outcomes that came out of these sessions. Um, so this is kind of an illustration of that where at the top you see, you know, here's uh, a much larger entry plaza and using that plaza to kind of deal with the water from our project and really display how water is, is dealt with on the plaza and from the building and activating that public space uh, with retail at the base of the building, which is a very unique, unique idea to have a city hall that is uh, um, you know, activated by retail. That's not a typical mixed use for a city hall. And the way that we were able to do this was rather than having two separate buildings was to get the city and the university to agree to stack their, their spaces. So the first two floors are the city of College Park spaces. The top two floors are the University of Maryland spaces. They share the same lobby. They all enter the building from the same plaza. They all experience it the same way. And now we have this nice, beautiful, large plaza that invites all of the citizens in. So now you can see, oh, sorry. Now you can see it's a much more generous plaza here that can be used for events or just daily activities. We created a variety of seating zones. This green area is kind of how we're dealing with the water from both the building and the plaza. It's our uh, filtration system for the water. And you can see that these pink areas are the retail that spill out onto this plaza to help activate it. There's a central lobby that can be entered from both sides. And now we've really created a new heart for the city of College Park. So here is the, the project. You can see the plaza here. What you don't see is the retail because it's still uh, ongoing. That, that came later than the accessing the building. But this bar here to the left are the office spaces, uh, second floor for the city, third and floor for the university third and fourth for the uh, university, I said, I mean. Uh, here's our central kind of lobby space here that you can enter from two sides. And here is the city council chamber with this large uh, area of glass that reflects back on the plaza, represents transparency in government. Everybody can see what's going on in there from the plaza and vice versa. Uh, here you can feel- You have one more, uh, uh, yeah, we're running out of- Perfect. Time. So, here is the, uh, and we also have great connections to bike lanes, bus lanes, and public transportation. Here's the interior, interior view, and then just one, two last shots. Here is the active plaza today. This is a first Friday event. They have every Friday that invites everybody in, and it is getting uh, used tremendously, both uh, on casual use during the days and also a lot of planned activities. So that's it. Uh, thank you, Scott. I'm super uh, excited uh, to hopefully see in the future the same crowds also at the harbor. And, yes, me too. Uh, so that's very exciting. But uh, I'm not going to do any questions now just to, for the purpose of time. And I'm going to um, uh, introduce our next speaker and then hopefully we have more time for a longer discussion after. Um, so yeah, our next speaker is uh, Case van Castella, who, uh, um, who joined OMA in 2001. He's working on the new Feyenoord soccer stadium in Rotterdam. Um, and between 2014 and 2018, he worked on the Feyenoord city master plan. A CIFCO HQ in Beijing is, uh, and the redevelopment of the former Ministry of Housing, uh, Spatial Planning and the Environment in The Hague. 
Um, and from 2007 to 2013, uh, CASE has led uh, the award-winning uh, the Rotterdam Project, which is the largest building in uh, the Netherlands, which I did not know until today, uh, which has 162,000 square meters of a mixed-use program. And between uh, 2002 and 2006, uh, CASE worked uh, as a project architect on the city center master plan and block six cinema complex in Almere. Uh, and the Koning, Koning and the Juliana Klein mixed use building in The Hague. Uh, and from uh, 1998 to 2001, Case worked for Renzo Piano Building Workshop in Paris. And prior to that, he worked in various offices in the Netherlands. Um, uh, this is a really extensive bio case, so I'm super excited to hear from you uh, on what you have to share today. So, with that, I open the floor. Uh, thank you, Selena. Um, I'm going to share uh, the screen. Um, sorry. All right. Um, I hope you can see, excuse me, my screen. Uh, I was told that my presentation could only take six minutes, so I have no introduction. Uh, on our office, uh, and I'm also only present uh, one project uh, that I've worked on. It's the final city master plan in Rotterdam. All right, before showing our final city master plan, I explain a bit more about the city of Rotterdam and its relationship with the Maas River. The city center is located on the north side of the river. The port is largely developed on the south side. For over a century, the port area expanded and moved to the west. Because of the growth of the port in the 1930s, many people from outside Rotterdam moved to the area around the port. This resulted in an expansion of the city on the south side. The river and port area, however, remained strong barriers between the north and south part. Since the 1990s, a redevelopment has been taking place from the oldest part area to the urban area of Kopfelzuid in order to better connect the two parts. This image is from the late 1920s, beginning 1930s, and show um, Rotterdam site on the construction. The location of the then inbuilt final stadium is indicated by the red dot. The stadium was built in 1936 and opened half a year later in 1937 after the infrastructure to the stadium was complete. Currently, the area of Rotterdam site is larger than the area north of the river. In recent decades, a large part of Rotterdam Zuid is characterized by many social homes, high unemployment rates, and a low level of education compared to the rest of the Netherlands. A bit more than 10 years ago, national program Rotterdam Zuid was initiated by the national and local government to improve this situation. Our project dates to the end of 2015, when we were approached by the local uh, football club Feyenoord about the design of the new stadium. Since 2005, Feyenoord had been working on plans for a new stadium and renovation of the old stadium. All plans had been canceled for various reasons. After the last design failed in 2015, Feyenoord asked for support from the municipality of Rotterdam, but the municipality uh, made some demands on their involvement. Because the stadium has a major impact on infrastructure, while it's often not in use, the municipality demanded that the new stadium be part of a larger area development. This creates a lively and pleasant area, plus facilities such as parking can be double used with other functions. The municipality and Feyenoord agreed on three possible stadium locations as part of an area called Stadion Park. Feyenoord City is part of Stadion Park and located in the north. Because nuisance during football matches in the area is currently a major problem, the municipality requested a mobility plan that determines how to get 63,000 visitors to the stadium. In the final city mobility plan of November 2016, various strategies have been elaborated. Because the backlog in education, employment, health and sports participation in the surrounding neighborhoods is the largest in the Netherlands, the municipality requested that final city should make an important contribution to the elimination of these backlogs through quality of living, education programs, employment, promotion of sports and exercise, etc. Part of our master plan is an extensive social plan for which we have worked with many local stakeholders. A closer look at the site shows an area with strong barriers such as railway lines, the river, 
main traffic roads, but also a dike and an underground water pipe, which cannot be moved and needs to be accessible in case of emergency 24 seven. The area of our master plan mainly contains large commercial warehouse buildings, parking lots and an isolated residential riverfront development from the late 90s. Important ambitions were to better connect the neighborhoods and create a new attractive area at the waterfront with the new stadium as the main contractor. Um, our side from a different angle. Uh, sorry. Yeah, not the most attractive space at the moment. Uh, in the beginning of 2016, we worked on three master plan options based on the different stadium locations. In the end, the Mars West location was selected as the preferred location for the stadium. Eight months later, we presented the concept master plan. On May 11, 2017, the concept master plan was approved by the city council. And three days later, final won the National League for the first time in 18 years. At that moment, all lights for the master plan and new stadium were green. In our master plan, the area of Feyenoord City and the rest of Stadion Park have been conceived as a hub in Feyenoord where everything resolves around sport and healthy living. For example, the public space is designed in such a way that it stimulates sports and exercise. Retail and catering are also sport related. Our wheel of ambitions show how our master plan should become a destination for events, a connector for the neighborhoods, a unique residential area with attractive outdoor space and above all future proof. Our master plan is divided into five areas. The new stadium functions as an icon at the waterfront and booster for the area. It is surrounded by a raised deck, which covers the rail tracks, the dike, a road and the water pipe. The deck and a breakwater protect the crowd in the stadium against pool fires from the rail tracks and the river. The urban bridge is a development with housing, offices and a hotel and connects Kopfersheid with the existing neighborhood of Veranda. The strip is a linear connection between the old and new stadium and includes parking and retail. It connects the heritage and future of Feyenoord. The old stadium will be renovated and given a new life with an athletic program, housing and restaurants. Kuy Park is a residential program in a green landscape. After the approval by the city council, the concept master plan was further developed into a final master plan in July 2018. At the same time, we have worked on the preliminary design for the stadium. Another image from our final master plan with the old stadium in the foreground and the city center in the back. These overviews show the build program of our master plan, approximately 4,000 residential units, sport facilities, offices, leisure and commercial functions, an outdoor program with parks, gardens, squares, and a tidal park in the river, and a social program, which consists of a sports school, sport experience program, and outdoor spaces for social activities. Six and a half years after the start of the project, after two revised DDs and two additional cost optimization phases, Feyenoord announced that the stadium project would be canceled due to the conditions in the construction market. With this decision, the Council of State annulled the entire Feyenoord City zoning plan because the stadium was such an important part of it. Together with the municipality, we are currently working on a new concept master plan with the same ambitions, but without the stadium as a main attractor, that will be presented to the Q team on March 17. After this, stakeholders are then involved for further elaboration. Unfortunately, our new design is still confidential. Next time, I can show you more. I guess that that fitted in six minutes. <laughs> uh, a little more, but I think you did really well. Thank okay. you so much. I'm really curious to see what the, the, the you know your next presentation okay, on this would look like uh, um, considering there's work in progress but it's also really interesting to see how huge projects like this especially infrastructure projects are subject to so many different outer uh, factors social uh, perceptions uh, economic factors and so yeah I'm, I'm really curious to see how this will um, the new plan will reflect everything that you shared um, again, in, uh, I will leave the more questions for later. Um, uh, and with that, uh, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, um, Jerome. Uh, hi, Jerome. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, 
Um, sorry to hear that you had troubles with uh, Zoom, but I'm glad that everything was resolved and you could make it. Um, so just a quick introduction. Uh, Jerome, C, uh, Jerome Gray founded Jerome C. Gray Architect, um, JCGA in 2013. He's a licensed architect in Maryland, Michigan, and Washington, DC, with over 30 years of experience in design and planning. Mr. Gray is an artist and historian who has documented the history of architects, buildings, and sites through exhibitions, publications, seminars, and lectures. He has served as a jurist uh, advisor for Morgan State Center for the Built Environment and Infrastructure Studies over the last de uh, decade. He was born, raised, and educated in the D, Detroit. Um, and with that, I'm really excited to see uh, um, open the floor for Mr. Gray. Thank you. Let me um, share my screen here. Okay. You see that? Uh, not yet. Oh yeah, I see it now. Okay, cool. So um, thanks for the introduction. Um, uh, could you make it full screen, uh, Jerome? Oh yeah, sorry, one sec. Nice. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, good. So uh, thank you for the introductions, really kind. Um, sorry for being late as well. Um, I didn't prepare any sort of firm background or anything. So I've just landed on uh, this first page because um, I wanted to encourage folks to, to take a look at a few things. I was poking around looking for some things that would apply to the, the topics that we're discussing today. And it occurred to me that there's there's three things, or actually I should say two things, and I'm going to piggyback my own onto it. But there's two things that I'm hoping folks can go take a look at. And if you were to go and look at it right now and uh, maybe even read the Cliff Notes version of it while I'm speaking, you'd probably be better served. One is uh, a book by Lawrence T. Brown called The Black Butterfly, which discusses the division uh, that you see in Baltimore geographically, racially, and socially. Um, I was honored to be able to present uh, Mr. Brown with uh, one of our awards for the Baltimore City Historical Society. I'm a part of the organization and do research there and serve on their board. Um, it's a fantastic book. It contextualizes uh, not just the current, but uh, not just the history, but the current circumstances that we find ourselves in in Baltimore City. The other is Not in My Neighborhood, which is a book that I, I hope everyone has read or intends to read. It's a fantastic summary of what's happened, not just in Baltimore, all over the country, and I suppose all over the world, when it comes to uh, the issues of gentrification, the issues of, um, of displacement, uh, migration, redlining, it touches on just about every issue that impacts Baltimore and other cities, and we feel the effects of it to this day. It shows the separation of uh, parts of the city that uh, existed in the recent past and how it's still sort of unspooling. The second uh, thing that I hope you guys can go and investigate is a, a, a site and a Instagram feed that's called Segregation by Design. If you haven't seen it, go to it right now and uh, bookmark it. It's fantastic. It has a series of, of, um, of graphics and uh, sort of capsulized histories of different cities and how they've been affected by uh, the, the, this ribbon of highways that uh, were constructed at the middle of the, certainly at the middle of the last century. And these just have ribbon through and cleaved through different communities, usually communities that are dispossessed to begin with. And in the name of urban renewal, in the name of, of, uh, of, of, of expanding our highway system, in the name of uh, sort of slum clearance, they uh, ended up uh, dividing many a community in ways that, um, that we found to be irreparable. I'm gonna go as, as quick as I can. I've got three projects that I wanted to cover, but I had a lot of stuff that I should have got on early to show. So this, this image um, is an overhead view. Someone took a drone shot of um, what we call the highway to nowhere. It's a stretch of road. And you're looking towards downtown from West Baltimore, a stretch of road that's, that's just about over a mile long. Uh, when it was built it, in the 70s, it displaced about oh, 1,400 uh, uh, buildings, uh, 
many families were were cut into, different communities uh, were formed as a result. It cuts through the heart of West Baltimore, which at that time and, and it was uh, sort of the, the most affluent part of Baltimore. Uh, folks were displaced from downtown. They migrated to the Northwest side as black folks started to travel in, into those areas. Suddenly this stretch of road and others as well in the city cut through and divided communities like Harlem Park, from Poppleton, uh, Madison Park, um, all the way through to where it reaches a, a Western terminus, um, which is the uh, West Baltimore Metro Station. Um, it missed out on a ton of opportunities, but, um, but uh, it was uh, beaten back by uh, protesters and folks who had, uh, or community activists who, who Put it to uh, put it to sleep. What it was intended to do was to connect downtown to the, the western uh, highway that's uh, I seventy, that uh, where it meets uh, uh, the uh, Baltimore Beltway. Um, it, it came in the wake of a bunch of other protests that occurred around town. We had um, instances in Federal Hill, and Scott Veith's uh, earlier presentation touched on it. This is just in Federal Hill and Fells Point where the there was a actual plans to continue highways across the Inner Harbor and throughout the city. Um, thank goodness it was stopped. Um, but they were left with this highway, unfortunately. Right now, it's just a six lane highway that cuts through. It has a series of bridges, as you can see here, that connect all the streets that used to be there. But it's it does a couple of things that uh, that are incredibly damaging. I, I stumbled upon this image. I'm sorry that it's grainy, but there's a series of great aerial images that are, were taken up all the way back until the 1920s that you can get at JHU's library. This shows the 1964 overhead aerial shot of the highway to nowhere. I don't capture all of it. There's some on the left-hand side that extends a little bit further beyond, but it captures the, the, the most incredible part, which is where it crosses uh, Fremont Street. It's the angled street that's on the right-hand side, just to the right of 1964. You can see within that bounded, uh, that rectangle that's in yellow, there were you know homes, there were churches, there were schools. These were communities that were knit together and that they were growing and they were vibrant. By 1972, this is what we see. This was when it started to be cleared to build the highway to nowhere. And in this, this block, in the series of blocks that you see, you can see complete demolition with the exception of one school, which eventually got taken down as well, um, all the way through. And in doing so, it cut off this key terminus, Fremont Street on the right-hand side. That street connected downtown to parts on the Northwest side that were critical. It, along with Pennsylvania Avenue, fed that corridor. It gave it life, it gave it entertainment, it gave it residence, residences, it gave it retail, it gave it all these resources that were just critical to a, a, a successful neighborhood. How am I looking on time? <laughs> am I okay? Selena? Uh, okay. You're, so, you're, so, you're doing okay, but you okay. have uh, three minutes left. Okay, okay, go as fast as I can. <laughs> so um, in yellow on the lower uh, right-hand side, that's where that stretch of the, the highway to nowhere is. Um, along that, that highway, we call it Route 40, it's also Edmondson Avenue for a stretch. We had a, uh, a project that was, on the, was kicking around for the last decade or so called the Red Line. It was a light rail extension that would serve the city uh, from its, its, furthest, its furthest point on the west all the way to the east. It would finally establish a connection that um, hasn't existed. Um, it, it would supplement or actually supplant a lot of really terrible transportation uh, flaws that we have when it comes to getting across town from where people are residing to where there's jobs that are being you know, opened up on each end of that handle of, of that bar. Unfortunately, it got shut down, uh, local politics occurred. It was, we got another administration in, they put it on the shelf. Uh, luckily we've had an election recently and there's a new governor in. Um, there's, an, there's a chance that it may come back. Um, that plus the highway to nowhere, these things are sort of currently in the headlines. There's some studies that are being uh, conducted. There's some monies that have been shaken loose. And we hope that uh, that, that actually you know, takes place. 
the, the arrow that's at an angle on the right-hand side um, shows the path that our metro uh, takes. We have a subway system that many people know about the thing. It uh, goes to the east side uh, at Johns Hopkins, and it travels up to the northwest side and terminates in Owings Mills. It is not the most successful subway. <laughs> if people see it, they think it's the like exactly like the DC metro system. Unfortunately, it's not. Um, it's been underutilized. The, the term transit-oriented development has been absent from, uh, uh, from it, and uh, it's missing out on a, a lot of opportunities as a result. Um, I've been lucky enough to work on three projects that are along that, that stretch. Oh, I should back up. That, that line that Metro serves also is along a historic corridor that's called the Pennsylvania Avenue Corridor. Um, it was the Black Harlem. It was that entertainment strip, that strip where businesses and homes and other resources existed um, during the heyday of, uh, of, of our existence along that, uh, along that corridor. Bit by bit, for a variety of reasons, it eroded. Uh, we, services went away. In a weird way, uh, desegregation ended up taking away uh, the need for some of these things that uh, that were you know, provided for the black community, then people were able to expand beyond, and these things got left left aside for a whole number of reasons. Unfortunately, it's gone by the wayside. Um, but we've been lucky enough to work on a couple of things that I'm hoping you know. Uh, brings you, have one it more back. you have one more minute. Uh, ah! <laughs> okay. <laughs> so now you have a lot of power, so. Okay. Well, look at one, and then we'll see how it goes. So, in the wake of the Freddie Freddie Gray riots in uh, 2015, um, we uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with it or not. Uh, for folks who are not in Baltimore City, it was a terrible uprising that occurred as a result of a, of an arrest that went uh, sideways and someone died in police custody. Um, it sparked a series of riots um, that lasted for three days. Um, it actually happened in a couple different locations, one of which was Mundalman Mall. It's at the, it's at the uh, terminus of Pennsylvania Avenue. And it's a mall that also has a major metro stop and a transportation mode. Um, when it occurred, uh, a group of folks here was tr were trying to figure out how to respond to it. Um, Local uh, companies like BGE, Whiting and Turner, and a few others uh, approached me and a couple of other, other folks and said, hey, could we establish a center at the location where the riots occurred, at the metro station, in between where it exists and uh, Douglas High School, where a lot of the kids uh, unfortunately participated in the rioting. We wanted to establish a social services center that collected a bunch of different organizations, thread. Invested Impact, Baltimore Core, Center for Urban Families to provide walk-in services for folks who were uh, in need. No more plugging into these things in an abstract way. It was you know, triage surge, uh, service right then and there. We created a space on a, <laughs> on a really low budget, which is essentially a, 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 a co-working space. But in doing so, each one of them were able to share their resources. We designed it, we put it together on a shoestring budget, uh, opened it up. It was only supposed to accommodate 73 people. Unfortunately, it was too popular. <laughs> it was well over 100 people using it on a regular basis. People walking in, whole lots of things occurring, whether it's people getting clothes, food, uh, resources for kids, jobs, rec uh, referral services. Um, thank goodness it was so successful that Whiting Turner recently bought the old Target building that was at the Mandalman Mall, and they are now converting it into a much larger version of this. So I, I've never been happier for a building that I've worked on to be uh, decommissioned. <laughs> so I, I believe that they're going to decommission it when they're when they're done with the uh, the renovation of the larger building. Um, I, I'll, I'll see if I can poke. Uh, uh, poke around to get to the other buildings. Uh, Upton Market was once the uh, the the heart and soul of the uh, of, of uh, the Pennsylvania corridor. It is a uh, a market that unfortunately has uh, has been in, in tough shape for a number of decades. Uh, they've done many of renovations to it. They've reclad it in ways that I can only call uh, the the building equivalent of a Cosby sweater. Um, unfortunately, the the uh, the front entrance is closed off. The side entrances are closed off. You've probably seen in the recent uh, uh, news that there's just been a whole lot of incidents, shootings, really tough neighborhood, really, really bad neighborhood at this point. We were commissioned to do a feasibility study. 
to see if we can, re can, can activate uh, not just the market, but also the adjacent plaza that hooks up to Metro. Um, we assembled a team, we studied it for a few years, came up with a bunch of different options and landed here. And we're really happy to see that they're starting to go forward with this. I saw that it was out, out on the street. Um, so we're happy that we were able to establish the template for it and the program for it. Um, I've got a little bit of time. Let's see, maybe I can make the last one. <laughs> um, uh, Edmondson Village at the end of where the red line would have, uh, it, it, before it, 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 it uh, traveled along the, the, the surface, it would uh, duck underneath and make its way to the Western uh, terminus. At that point is where we uh, worked on a assistance center that was part of the, the St. Bartholomew Episcopal Church um, renovations that we had uh, undertaken in 2020, uh, 2019. We only only done a portion of the renovations, but the uh, substantial piece, the link in the center is something that they're still investigating to expand their social services component, which is called 40 West Assistance and Referral Center. It is essentially a one-stop shop, not unlike uh, what we did at Mundalman, but um, it's much, much more intensive when it comes to you know giving out not just uh, you know clothing, food, uh, job referral, uh, you know, providing housing. It's an amazing service. If you guys don't know about it, uh, you really should give to it. You really should visit it. You really should volunteer at this location. Um, and you can give money as well in order so that they can complete their campaign <laughs> to build the center. Um, I'm going to leave it on this splash, which is my uh, at uh, on Instagram. Uh, I'm engaged in a really large history project that's uh, documented over 5,000 buildings in Baltimore City uh, to date. Uh, it is a, a sketch, uh, uh, nominally a sketch exercise that documents uh, the history of these buildings that are being uh, so deaccessioned or just left for dead or demolished by neglect. I'm trying to capture as many of these things as possible and engage everybody else to do the same thing. Um, I think I'm well out of time and well over. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, please go look at it and, uh, and and engage with it. I've also shared the links that Jerome shared on uh, the chat so that it's easier for everyone to access. Um, I also take full responsibility for this going over time, but it's you, you all have such incredible work to show. So I, it's very hard for me to also interrupt you and be a bit firm. So this is completely on me. Um, uh, but uh, uh, I, I'd like to open the floor to have the four of you uh, discuss. Um, uh, um, to start with, um, so you have like big projects, these huge infrastructure projects that were imagined to be something, but were in reality something else, uh, or, the, or the negative impact that it had on the city. Um, in projects like this, what do you think should happen? Is it should, you know, demolish, start from scratch, uh, or, you know, uh, has it found a place in society or in the community that it, it requires creative thinking? Um, uh, yeah, um, uh, Scott, since you've just. Uh, I yeah, I mean, my, my approach to that would be to uh, engage the citizens and find out what people want. What, what, what are their hopes? What are their goals for the, the project? Because that will ultimately mm -hmm. de determine the outcome of whether you keep something uh, or get rid of it. Um, and, and the other thing that um, I think is important and, you know, Jerome's presentation reminded me of it's important not to just have uh, meetings that are inclusive, inclusive of citizens in one location. You have to go out mm -hmm. to their locations to make it accessible to them. So don't invite everybody to come down to your site and hope that they can find public transportation to get there, get daycare to get there, whatever. Go out and make sure that you go out into those neighborhoods and find out what their hopes and dreams are. But I'd love to piggyback onto that, Scott. I, it's critical that the community uh, gets involved. Uh, I know that Scott's been doing some stuff around town. It's really great. Um, we, uh, while working on Avenue Market, we identified 13 stakeholders. And by the time we were done, we realized that we had only covered a fraction. Uh, we needed to reach out to the community and have them. We needed to drop our arrogance and really turn a lot of this stuff over to them being the designers. We, it's a tough thing to, a tough pill to swallow to think that an architect would, would let these things go. 
but these solutions have to come from the community. They have to be developed in the community. They have to be designed. The input needs to come from the community. It can't be something that gets gentrified. It can't be something that gets taken over and looked at from a, a developer standpoint. It must come from the community if we want to change things, um, whether it's Avenue, whether it's Mondawmin, whether it's West Baltimore. Uh, that the paradigm has to shift. Um, uh, 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 then I would like to also continue this conversation with Pace and Martin. How, how do you see that as the sort of citizen or the local stakeholder engagement? How does that go, out, uh, go about in the Dutch context? Um, yeah, I can say something about this. Um, so for the final city master plan, there were a lot of stakeholders. Um, uh, also, a lot of stakeholders involved. You always uh, involve, uh, I would say, uh, too little. Um, but um, for me as an architect, I've attended so many uh, info nights uh, together with uh, 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 residents, uh, companies, other stakeholders. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's super important. Uh, on the other hand, um, that is my experience, especially from a uh, quite delicate and political uh, project of this scale. Uh, what you mainly read in the newspapers are mainly complaints that people are not involved enough, etc. So um, it's 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 difficult. It's tricky. Mm -hmm. uh, again, it's super important, uh, but for a large project like this, I think that uh, often or always people uh, feel unheard or whatever. Yeah. And my experience is uh, is is kind of the same, but we we have gone beyond information evenings. I mean, this is this is uh, from a municipality. They 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 yeah they uh, do this. They demand this. They 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 want this. But uh, our experience, uh, we do a big project in Tilburg Nord, also uh, uh, our own site in Rotterdam. You have to involve them really and not give them information only. You ha really have to. Uh, so we, we were helping with getting money to the uh, daily uh, volunteers that work in the, in the food garden. Hey, we, 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 had, uh, um, we made a um, program for them that just to get uh, money from other companies in the neighborhood. Uh, and we were the first one to 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 uh, to engage them uh, in this and also in Tilburg I, I mean you really have to give more than only information you really have to give them the tools to also say something and and tools to uh, participate in the process uh, only information and only speaking on them with a yeah on a on a on a educational level or on a, on a, on a higher uh, it, 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 yeah, it doesn't feed the process. No, but, but for the record, that's what no, that uh, was not what I meant, uh, Mark. No, no, no it's not against. Not, it's okay, not okay, against no, but at least said. for the record, at least for the record, because I totally understand what you were saying. But our info nights um, included a lot of uh, roundtable uh, talks in smaller groups. Um, mm -hmm. We have had workshops, uh, etc. Um, yeah, and still. Uh, like I said, many people feel unheard, uh, and nevertheless, you you have to keep on uh, involving them. It's uh, it's yeah. absolutely necessary. Uh, Jerome, you wanted to say something, and then I'd have to conclude because uh, I've I, we've run out of time. Yeah. I I didn't, but I will. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, you unmuted yourself. So well, what, <laughs> one of the um, well, yeah, empowering folks. Uh, just to sort of piggyback on uh, what you just said. Um, what we've got happening here recently is a lot of instances where people are just having to react to bad decisions that are being made by developers and municipalities. We have not been in power. We have not been educated. We have not been uh, able to embrace the histories of our own places and spaces. Um, as a result, we haven't been able to defend them or to define them. So we get things like uh, in the last week, we've lost a... Uh, a uh, historic mansion, the Sellers Mansion, that's in the Harlem Park neighborhood. It's a beautiful mansion with incredible history. We lost that. Um, we had shootings at the Avenue Market uh, along Lawrence Street where you know, several kids got shot. At Edmondson uh, Village where uh, my uh, assistance center is, 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 
is being designed. We had four kids shot two months ago. Um, these things, this is a symptom of folks not being able to know more about their community, their community's history. They don't have the ability to defend the buildings and the spaces that they have. And as a result, when something happens like the Sellers Mansion, it burns down, everybody just gathers around too late and it's a, it's a reactive situation instead of a proactive situation. What we're trying to do in the, in the history community and the architecture community here is to define those spaces ahead of time. Say that these are the places that are important. These are the people that are important and these are the things that they need to defend. Um, otherwise it's just all reacting. We're losing too much. Um, yeah, I'd like to conclude with that somber note, but uh, sort of uh, uh, a message that there is a need for proactivity as opposed to um, late re uh, reactivity. Um, thank you everyone for being here today. Uh, and thank you for the people who stayed, uh, uh, even though it um, went over time. So we really appreciate uh, your patience. Um, so thank you so much. I wish you a lovely evening or a lovely uh, afternoon ahead of you, depending on where you are. Um, thank you again. Um, yeah. Christina, any last words? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Selena, for really leading this. Thank you, guests. You're being amazing, really. Um, yeah. I, and thank you, audience, for sticking with us. I, I have just one paragraph I would like to say. It's a collective it's a collective, Scott, of all that you guys have said a little bit. It is designing an industry, facilitating a collective, addressing social cohesion and debate. Site analysis is about understanding the community, its history, and providing a design which promotes a positive impact on site. So really, thank you so much for, for this. I would like to tell the audience that this has been recorded. It will be on YouTube, the Morgan uh, channel. For those interested, there are credits for this session. I've been extensively typing it on the chat. Please take note of that um, of the link. If not, email me. Um, next, next, uh, thank you very much to our sponsors, of course, uh, without which this will not be possible. And uh, please join us next week uh, on Tuesday, the seventh. We are going to welcome. Um, J Jason Niels from Jason Niels Architects and Design, Zico Lopez from uh, Spatial Codes, Tyler Miller from Gensler, and Alina Karanstaski from X uh, Architects. And uh, yes, thank you. Have a nice evening. I'll see some of you soon in Rotterdam and uh, some of you in Baltimore. And I would like to, to meet with you, Scott, really soon. You will be involved in my studios for sure. <laughs> Great. Okay. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. See you next week. Thank you so much. Bye. Next week. Bye. Bye.